So I'm just going to take a few moments to welcome you folks to the Trent University Virtual Winter Open House. And we're super excited that we're able to welcome you to the Ancient Greek and Roman Studies session. So my name is Emma, don't worry, I won't be talking for too long. I will just be the moderator of this session. And with me today, I have two lovely folks. I have a professor, Dr. George Kovacs from the Ancient Greek and Roman Studies and Shelby, who is a current student in the program. So we are excited for the path that you guys have ahead of you, and we do look forward to sharing with you all of the reasons why Trent has been ranked the number one undergraduate university in Ontario for now 11 consecutive years. So along the way, I will just be posting some information in the chat for you guys, um, so you're able to access those links throughout the presentation and afterward. But during this session, it will be set up into um, a Q&A at the end. So first we'll start off with letting you guys know that you're able to ask questions in the chat. And at the end of the session, like I said, we'll be having that cute short, uh, short cute nay for about 10 minutes. And that way members of our panel are able to provide the, uh, you folks with the information that you need. So I do invite you to add all your questions into the chat box and you can find that on the bottom of your screen. So during the presentation, you can see we are offering closed captioning. So to, it should be automatically enabled, but if not, you folks can just click the three dots at the bottom of your right hand at the right side of your screen and click show subtitles. So if you have any issues, please let me know in the chat. And our events page, you will see that we do have live chats happening today. So drop into that. It just makes sense if you have any questions for admissions or graduate studies that we may not be able to answer. Um, like I said, you can just type in the chat into the main page in that little box. So. With all of those housekeeping items, we will head into a short 15-minute uh, presentation from Dr. George Kovacs, and then we'll have some questions for Shelby so they're able to give us a perspective on what it's like being a student in the program, and then we will launch into the Q&A. So with that, I will pass it over to our panel members. All right. <clears throat> uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming to an early morning session. Um, I know there are lots of other sessions uh, going on right now, so it's hard to pick and choose. Uh, and for those of you watching the recording later, uh, welcome as well. Um, so thank you, Emma. And as Emma noted, I'm going to give um, just a short uh, mini lecture. So if I share my screen here, um, you'll see there's our basic information. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about here is an excerpt from um, a lecture that I give in one of my courses. Uh, we are going to talk about the anatomy of a god, right? So the ancient Greek and Romans um, had a whole bunch of gods in their uh, pantheon uh, that they believed influenced the world. So we're going to talk about, you know, what is it about a Greek and Roman god? that makes them a Greek or Roman god. So to do this, we're going to need a god. So let's pull one up here uh, and we can give him a name. Let's call him for the sake of argument, Zeus, right? Uh, and in fact, this is Zeus in my image. There's a statue um, in Smyrna in Asia Minor um, that is um, uh, Jupiter slash Ju Zeus, depending on whether you wanna use his Roman or his Greek title. So if we're calling this, a god, this guy a god, we need to establish a little bit of terminology. What are we going to call him? And it seems simple that maybe we might call him a god, but this is actually incorrect. We're going to call him a god, right? What is the difference here? I think you can see, right? The first word that I've put up is a capital G god. And most of us will be a company, uh, you know, accustomed to putting that capital letter on G uh, because most of us are used to uh, religious points of view that work from the point of view of monotheism, right? A single deity culture, right? Um, so in the Judeo-Christian tradition, as one example uh, that I'm most familiar with, right? Um, there is one single God who is honored, but in the Greek and Roman system, it is a polytheistic system. So many gods, so even just the way that we write the word starts to indicate some really key differences in the way that we think about um, these deities who influence the world. 
Um, obviously, the Greeks and Romans didn't call them gods because they didn't speak English. Um, they started speaking Greek, of course. And so what terms did they use? Uh, one that was very popular was a thanatos, um, literally, as I've translated here, without death, right? And this is one of the key defining features. What's the difference between a god and a human, right? Humans can die, gods do not. Uh, they also use the word daimon, uh, which means something akin to spirit or divine force. And there's a whole hierarchy to the divine structure um, of different gods and spirits and supernatural creatures. Um, and daimon is kind of a catch-all that gets them all. Um, and those at the very top, the most powerful of these supernatural um, features, the theos, the god. Um, and you can even already see, right, if I back up just a little bit, right, monotheism, polytheism, right, you can see that word god, um, theos, in our own English terminology. Uh, for distinction, um, a couple of other terms I might throw at us, brotos, uh, the word for mortal, and one that's really telling, ephemeros, right? Um, humans exist in a daily sense or a temporary sense, right? In English, something that is ephemeral is something that is only here for a short period of time. Um, and so again, we see that emphasis on the difference between gods and humans being whether they die or not. Gods don't die, but humans do. Um, one thing that we should note about our god, um, as we see our statue here, uh, another fancy word, he is anthropomorphic. He is human-shaped. Um, and this is, uh, in many ways, uh, very distinct from the way that we might think of, again, I'll use the Judeo-Christian god as an example, right, who is all-powerful, all-knowing, but unknowable, right? He's not really thought to be, you know, maybe he's a man in the sky, um, but for the Greeks and the Romans, right? These gods were very much human shaped, um, both, you know, sort of inside and out with a few exceptions, right? And I'll throw my butt in there, uh, but they look like humans and they behave like humans. They can get angry, they can get sad, they can be happy. Um, they can be um, uh, attracted to um, other, other uh, beings, right? But there are a few key differences, again, between the human and the god. So if we look at our Zeus here, we notice uh, that he's kind of ripped. He's in pretty good shape, right? Um, gods are physically perfect, right? Um, with almost no exception, right? So they are human shaped, but they are the absolute ideal of the human shape. Um, further to that, we can see he's got that uh, powerful manly beard, right? Um, Jupiter or Zeus is a real picture of virility, right? He exudes a kind of manly strength as the Greeks and the Romans understand that. So he's very paternal um, looking. And so he's got a nice big full beard. Uh, and it's hard to tell uh, just because uh, I've got my statue out of context here, uh, but he is super tall. This statue is actually eight feet tall. And that's not just because the sculptor actually had a really big piece of marble to carve. Um, the gods were thought to be not only are they, you know, ideally, you know, perfect, uh, but part of that idealism is they're literally super sized. And that's not just, you know, the males. Um, so here we have a text, the Homeric hymn to Aphrodite, which is a song sung in honor of Aphrodite from the 6th century BCE. Um, and she reveals herself to a guy named Anchises. Uh, and when she does, she stands up and her head hits the roof, right? Her head touched the beam of the lofty roof and from her cheeks shone forth immortal beauty. So she's, you know, physically perfect, but she's also really, really large, right? So human shaped, but kind of super human shaped. So those are some of the external characteristics, but the gods are a little bit different on the inside as well. 
um, they don't consume food in the same way that humans do. So what do they eat and drink? Uh, two substances, one is nectar, and the other is ambrosia. And it's not really clear what these substances are. Um, sometimes we have nectar described more as a drink and ambrosia slightly more as a food, but the descriptions are really fluid. So ambrosia sometimes to be, seems to be in liquid form as well. Um, that word ambrosia, by the way, literally means not brotas. Remember that term that I gave you a couple of minutes ago? Um, brotas for mortal. They literally eat food that is not mortal or not for mortals, right? So that's what they consume. There we go. I'm going to chew it up. Um, and it has a result on the inside of their body because just as they don't eat human food, they also don't have human blood. Uh, instead, they have a substance called ecor, and it's described in a bunch of different ways. Sometimes it's a golden, you know, uh, fluid. Sometimes it's a really thick black fluid. Different authors have different ideas of what this stuff is. But the point is, is that it's not blood and it's something different that powers the gods. And in fact, ecor um, has kind of magical properties if you can get your hands on it. Um, so we have a myth, for example, of a guy named Talus, who is a bronze giant. Um, think of like a robot or maybe a golem. Um, so he's a big bronze statue, but you put the ecor inside of him and all of a sudden he can walk around and do things. And my image here, of course, is from the 1963 film, uh, Jason and the Argonauts, which I highly recommend. We watched it. I have a cinema um, an antiquity on screen course. We watched the, the film last semester. Um, and the Talos scene is, is great. Um, and they de defeat him by causing the, they open a little valve and all of the ecor runs out. And as soon as there's no more ecor in him, he falls over and he, he, he collapses. Um, so I noted, right, differences between, you know, sort of traditional uh, Greek and Roman gods versus more modern uh, models. And again, I'll use the Judeo-Christian God. I recognize that's not going to be everyone's experience, uh, but it's one that I'm familiar with. And there's still a fairly wide familiarity with, with this particular model, right? But if you, you know, go through your Judeo-Christian God, right? He is typically benevolent. He wants what's best for mankind. Uh, I mentioned earlier, he is indiscernible. We cannot understand, we cannot perceive um, God. Um, he's simply too big. Um, and he is a sort of divine embodiment of moral good, right? God is good, and godliness is goodliness. And, you know, a, you know, sort of trying to be like God or follow the word of God is in the Judeo-Christian model, right, a path to moral goodness, moral righteousness. Greek gods are not benevolent. They are entirely self-interested. They will sometimes help out mortals, but they do it because they like that particular mortal, right? Um, perhaps it's a child of the God or it's a lover of the God, right? But it's always kind of motivated by a self-interest. Um, I mentioned, right, they are anthropomorphic. They are human-shaped. Um, and many of our stories, including, you know, all the way back to Homer's Iliad, right? The gods are seen running around, interacting with mortals. And it's very easy to kind of understand their motivations and their actions. Uh, they are not divine embodiments of uh, moral good, right? And in fact, really that idea of them being anthropomorphic comes back, right? They are basically superpowered humans, right? That, that's what they are. So all of that, um, you know, like I said, that's my mini lecture. It derives specifically from a course that I teach, right? God's Heroes Monsters, which is a first year course open to anyone who wants to take it. Um, I would say most of the people in the, in the class are taking it as an elective rather than as a major. Um, and we spend a lot of time talking about, you know, how does the Greek and Roman understanding of the world, um, you know, what is that understanding and how does it affect their behavior and why is it important? What are the differences between us and them, right? So understanding that they, 
you know, that they think of their gods in a very different way than we might today uh, is an important, you know, way of accessing um, the ancient world. And while I'm on the subject, I'll note a couple of other first year courses that we offer that are quite popular. Um, so Professor Elton, my colleague, uh, teaches War in the Desert, which is cross-listed with history. Um, and he looks at the concept of ancient warfare through the theme of big battles that have happened in the, in the desert. So um, he can go all the way back to the Battle of Kadesh if he wants. Um, he can do Kunaxa. He can do some of the Parthian engagements. So he can go all the way through the Greek and Roman world. Um, and talking about, you know, the way that military history is understood and, and perceived um, and, you know, sort of a nice survey of the history of the ancient world. Uh, there's also uh, 1200, the Trojan War, uh, typically taught by my colleague who's in anthropology, but he's a Bronze Age archaeologist looking at the story of the Trojan War, um, the legend of it. Uh, and really looking at it largely through an archaeological ex, you know, uh, lens, right? What would Troy have looked like? What language would they have spoken? What if there was a Trojan War? What is the historical evidence for it? What would it have looked like, right? So um, again, a nice kind of survey course through a really interesting theme of this war. Um, I'll note as well, we offer both our uh, languages, right? So if we're gonna study the Greeks and Romans, uh, being able to speak Latin, the language of the Romans is important. Um, and if we're going to study the ancient Greeks, um, ancient Greek is important. Um, I will note they are not required for an ancient Greek and Roman studies degree. You can take uh, courses entirely in translation. Um, but students who are thinking about going into graduate school, for instance, um, Latin's particularly applicable if you're learning other modern Romance languages. It gives you a really nice background uh, into how those languages work. Um, and then finally, um, I will just make reference. Um, oh, oh, there we go. Um, the co-op in ancient Greek and Roman studies. Uh, you guys are going to hear a lot about these today, these co-op programs. Uh, because they are absolutely brand new. The ink has barely dried on our approval process. Um, so essentially, you know, you'll, you'll, most programs will probably mention these because we've developed it as a co-op program and then added the uh, various bachelor's programs. Um, so in our instance, um, ancient Greek and Roman study. And you can see here the typical kind of map that you would do, um, you know, you study, you know, regular courses in your first year, you take a few courses in the summer, and then you start doing work terms um, interspersed. Uh, and I think um, there's an admissions live chat going on all day, I think, if that's correct. Emma's nodding her head, so that's good. So if you want to know more about that, that's probably the place to start. Um, so yeah, I've talked a long time, so I should stop talking. Um, and I can open the floor to questions if there are any. Um, and if not, Emma's got some questions that uh, Shelby and I can field as well. So why don't I pause there? I will turn off my screen share. There we go. Yeah. Thanks so much, Dr. Kovacs. That was super interesting, even though I'm not, I've already graduated, but I always love hearing the mini lectures. Um, for folks who have not uh, popped questions into the chat, that is totally okay. I just like to let folks know that there's no such thing as a stupid question. Please ask questions. Um, if it's about admissions, the programs, anything else, questions directly for Dr. Kovacs or for Shelby, um, they're more than happy to answer those. Um, but for that, I would like to do um, like a mini interview style with Shelby because we're really fortunate to have a student that's currently in the third year of the program. So Shelby, I'd like you to tell me what you love most about your experience in the program or what you love most about this particular program. Yeah, um, as Professor Kovacs mentions, I've taken all those first year courses and I can say they're all great to take. Um, but if I had to pinpoint one thing I love most about this program, 
it's as you progress further, it is a smaller program. So your class sizes do get smaller. And that just allows for you to like, just create deeper connections with both your classmates and your professors. And even in the third year, I feel like I'm in my own little community, my own little bubble of ancient Greek and Roman studies. I pretty much know everybody in my class and we're all friendly with each other. We all help out with like studying, with any questions we have. And the same with the professors, they get to know you on a personal level. They're always available if you need help with questions on assignments or even you know if you wanna progress further into grad school, they're there to help you with that as well. So I really do like how small my program is because it really gives me the ability to just form these connections and create this community that I've had over the past few years here at Trent. Absolutely love to hear that, Shelby. And it's nice to hear that you're able to create those connections that are able, you're able to keep all the way through the degree. Um, and I'm assuming that's the same thing with your faculty and your TAs as well. Oh yeah, um, like faculty wise, you know, you get to you get to know the profs on a personal level. They're all passionate about what their they, their areas of study is, um, and then they get to know what you're sort of interested in. Well, so they help you. Like I'm interested in moving on to grad school later on, so I've had a few profs, you know, kind of guide me which schools are better, which you know supervisors are better. So they help you in your future as well, not just you know your current line of study. So. That's great to hear, especially if you're thinking about grad school. Um, so with that, now that we know a little bit more about the program and, and, and heard from you, Shelby, can you tell us maybe one piece of advice that you have for a student that's planning to study in the Ancient Greek and Roman Studies program here at Trent? Yeah, um, my advice applies not just to this program, but I think to university in general. One of the key tools I would say that you should bring into university is a good sense of time management because that's just gonna make your life 10 times easier. Uh, university can be very overwhelming, especially when you're first starting. I started off as a mature student. So it was a few years between you know, high school and university. So it was a little daunting for me. Um, I really recommend looking at your syllabuses early and just marking down all your due dates on a calendar. So you can visually see where everything's gonna be due. So you know, maybe I should get started early on this assignment, or maybe I should ask for an extension on this assignment. So yeah, time management and learning how to, you know, sort of balance all your assignments with time. I have a wall calendar, so I can, like I said, visually see when everything is due. That has done wonders for me. So yeah, just planning your time out well will help you be very successful in university. And that's absolutely correct. I think a lot of students really learn that when they come to first year and realize how independent the learning is compared to high school. So that's some great advice. Um, as I mentioned folks earlier, um, we do have Q&A. So by all means, please ask any questions that you have. We have about five, between five and seven more minutes. Oh, Liam, you're raising your hand. Would you like to unmute yourself? Sure. Uh, I do have uh, two questions for Shelby. Um, you said that teachers are uh, asking for extensions. Do teachers often give extensions when you ask or not really? Um, they typically do if it's in advance. A lot of teachers like at least about two to a week before the deadline. Um, like for example, this semester, I have a lot of essays due in the same week. So I've already reached out to my prof. This is at the beginning of April and she's extended it for me. So if you come to them in advance, just letting them know, hey, I have a lot of stuff due in the same week as your paper, they're more likely to do it. But like I said, do it in advance. If you're gonna email them like, you know, the day before the deadline, they're a little more hesitant, but. Makes sense. Um, also, what are you thinking of doing for uh, post-university like work-wise? Uh, work-wise, I'd like to end up somewhere uh, working within a museum or within archives, that's what I'm thinking of doing. But as of right now, uh, my plan is to go to grad school and then to go and get a PhD, so. Makes sense, awesome. Also, Emma, really quickly, were you in charge of the live chat um, like two or three months ago? There, you guys had another open house. Um, I did do some of the live chat, yeah. Okay, sorry, you just looked familiar and I was trying to remember. <laughs> yeah, that I, I, we were just talking about this before the session. Um, Dr. Kovacs has had some students recognize him when they go into the first class. So um, yeah, it's probably likely that you'd see me somewhere. Um, I tend to moderate a lot, but I did do the live chat, so. Um, 
also really quick you said that you uh graduated so what, what's your position at the trend because when i did a, an actual physical tour of the school i saw you as well oh my gosh i love this i love when students are like hey i remember you um so I'm the acting tours coordinator right now. Uh, I'm an enrollment advisor here. So that that is very much my job. <laughs> when did you come for a tour, Liam? Uh, I can't remember the exact day, but it was a few months ago. Yeah, a few months ago. Yeah, I definitely would have been working here. So um, it's nice that you recognize me. That's super exciting. Are you thinking about coming uh, to Trent for the program? Uh, I actually already got accepted into it. I'm going um, next September. You've accepted your offer. Congratulations, I Liam. Why, oh, thank you. Uh, I'm really excited for the class. It looks out. It looks absolutely awesome. Good, good. Um, there is a question in the chat uh, from Brooke. So what kind of work experience would we get in the co-op program? That's a really good question. Uh, I think it's going to vary a lot. Um, so essentially, <clears throat> as I understand the co-op program, you work with, um, I think it's the career space people to find a placement. Um, and depending on what your placement is, I mean, that's going to, to basically dictate what kind of um, experience you're, you're pulling in, right? So, you know, for something like ancient Greek and Roman studies, there's actually quite a wide range of possible position types that might work, right? Um, you know, if you were clerking for a law firm or working for a media relations company or anything that that relies on a lot of communication or a lot of careful reading or analysis, right? Those are all going to provide, you know, the kind of skill sets that are pretty parallel to what we do in ancient Greek and Roman studies, right? We are a broad multidisciplinary program. So you do some literature, you do some history, you do some uh, philosophy, some archaeology. Um, so all of those skill sets are going to contribute to you know, your critical thinking skills, your ability to contextualize, um, you know, larger world problems, um, your analysis, all of that, right, is going to fit in. So I'm very interested to see how the co-op program is going to work. Like I said, it's, it's, it's brand new, um, but I suspect we're going to have co-op students coming to ancient Greek and Roman studies already having sort of found a placement through the career space. And that's going to have a real um, interesting effect on, on how the two mesh together. Um, there's another question there, but that might be for, oh, for Emma, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's okay. Um, Dr. Kovacs, that was a really great explanation. Um, as you were mentioning, it's very new. So we're still ironing out the kinks for that, but um, it, it's different from our current co-op programs as Dr. Kovacs was saying, because you are coming in to, so say for example, you're doing computer science co-op, the program is designed based around the co-op. So students that are doing the ancient Greek and Roman studies degree don't have to participate in co-op, but they may like to. Mm -hmm. um, and that'll, you'll be able to figure all that out when you come in first year and our career space is super helpful and we'll be able to answer all the questions that you have. And it's usually within the Peterborough area. So we don't like to send students too far out unless they request it. Um, so for that other question is from Heather, when should we be expecting our offers if we haven't gotten them yet? And when usually is the cutoff time for offers? So um, just quickly, offers at Trent University are sent out on a rolling basis. So what that means is we, uh, most programs, we don't send them out in chunks. So no news is good news. We've sent out about 65% of our offers for um, fall 2022. So that means there are still lots of offers that have yet to be sent out. Our admissions team obviously works as quickly as they can. I would not worry too much. Um, like I said, no news is good news. And if you do have further questions, I can pop our email into the chat if they're more related to admissions, or you can hover, head over to the admissions live chat. But with that, all the housekeeping, Liam has another question. Go ahead, Liam. Uh, yeah, for Mr. Kovacs. Yep. Um, so I want to go for, I'm doing the teacher education stream as well, and I got to figure out a minor. Uh, okay. I'm debating if I want to teach in high school or if I want to eventually teach uh, like at a university or college level. Okay. Um, but I still have to figure out my minor. Would you recommend anything or? Uh, a minor to go along with ancient Greek? Yeah, for a second teachable. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and it really will differ if you decide. Um, so teaching at, in, at a high school environment and teaching at a university environment are very, very different career paths, actually. 
Um, on the face of it, they look similar, but you know, um, I don't have a teaching degree, for example, right? Um, so I did a degree in ancient Greek and Roman studies. I then did a master's degree and then I did a PhD, right? Which leads you into greater degrees of specialization, okay? Um, so if it's the university career path that you're looking at, that's the path you're, you're looking at. Uh, if you're thinking about high school, there's all kinds, right? Um, history meshes very well with ancient Greek and Roman studies. Uh, English um, literature meshes very, very well. Cultural studies meshes well. Um, because we are so interdisciplinary as a program, um, we reach out in all kinds of different um, directions. I have a course right now that's cross-listed with our gender and social justice, which might seem like an improbable pairing um, uh, on the face of it, but, but it's a really, really interesting course and it's going very, very well. It actually um, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, gender studies class with ancient Greek and Roman studies makes a lot of sense. Yeah, um, we, have, we have a couple. Yeah. Did you find it overly difficult to find a job after getting your PhD or no? Uh, at the university level, the, um, the, the job market is extremely challenging. Yeah, that's right. Um, so I'm always very cautious about recommending the, the PhD. Um, the BA level is fine, you know, like it's a solid humanities degree, uh, and it's got a great deal of portability across a wide range of job markets, right? Um, the master's degree is an extra level of specialization, but it's only a year or two, right? So, um, so I usually have no problem uh, recommending that. Talented students can usually find funding, so you're not building, you know, if you if you're you know, taking student loans to get through your undergraduate degree, you typically aren't for your master's degree if you've got a solid um, program behind you. Uh, the PhD, you need to be very, very serious about it. And, you know, um, but I would say, you know, don't worry about that too much, right? If that's a long goal, long term goal, that's great, right? Sort of park it there. You know, the best preparation you can do for the PhD program is to excel in your BA program, right? So, you know, focus on doing that. And, you know, within your four years, right, things may change, or you may solidify your career goals. And either way, you know, you're great. Yeah. Pretty awesome. Thank you so very much. You're very welcome. Thank you very much, Liam, for all your questions and everyone else who chimed in. Dr. Kovacs and Shelby, thank you so much. Um, we are about to around 1030. I have put a little bit of housekeeping items in um, in the chat for you folks to be able to see for our hoodie draws and links back to the live page if you do have admissions questions. Um, so with that, I do want to take a moment again to thank the members of our panel for being here with us today and sharing your knowledge with us. Um, this session has been recorded and it will be posted to the Open House webpage if you wish to review the session again later and any of our sessions that are taking place today. I would like you to I would like you to come to our campus so I'd like to extend that invitation and uh, Liam I know you've already been here but by all means come visit us again we're hosting in person tours as well as in person spring open house events so you can register to join us on campus for an event today. And I just would like to remind you that there's going to be a lot of great sessions starting soon and for the rest of the day, so I do hope you enjoy the rest of the event. And Shelby, Dr. Kovacs, do you have any last minute uh, comments or things you'd like to say? I don't think so. Um, if you're really interested in um, ancient Greek and Roman studies, uh, ahc at trentu.ca, that puts you in touch with our admin assistant uh, and she'll field the question. She'll either send it to me if it's program related or to admissions or um, to whoever might be able to best answer the question. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Kovacs, and thank you for everyone else. Um, it was lovely to chat with you today, and I hope you have a great rest of day. Thanks, you too. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.